Uh, thank you all for joining us. It may, some of you may have noticed that I'm not Eddie Glaude. Um, that is very good for Eddie and for you, uh, <laughs> that I'm not. Um, we just texted him a picture of the two of us. I had a Padron cigar, which Eddie also likes, which may be why he has COVID. Uh, but it's fine. He's fine. Uh, <laughs> worry not. He's on the mend. He's on the mend. Yes. He's on the mend. Uh, That's why he's so not here. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a pinch hitter here, but honored to be with my, uh, my friend uh, Imani Perry, who may have a really good night because the last time we were together in the morning in Nashville, she won the National Book Award at lunchtime. So. <laughs> Right? It's true. So I was worried I wasn't going to make it there. <laughs> we were in, in Nashville together. Yes. So yes. let's see what happens now. Could be great. Uh, but thank you. And um, uh, we're talking about uh, really the uses of history. Mm. Uh, can history be redemptive as uh, as well as divisive? Uh, and obviously, given the nature of the topic, mm. it will be inherently divisive. But do you embrace that or do you try to push it out of the arena, uh, which is sort of where the pop popular conversation seems to be at this point? Yeah. What do yeah. you think? Oh, I mean, I think you embrace it. I mean, I don't know what the alternative. I'm interested in truth. So therefore, and I'm interested in complex histories. And I'm interested in this sort of re re this question for me that persists, which is how is it that we make these sort of extraordinary leaps, I think, of progress when it comes to the ideal of democracy, when it comes to, you know, um, the vision of an inclusive society, and then there's this sort of in intense backlash and retrenchment. I'm deeply interested in that as a repeated cycle. And so for me, the whole thing that draws me to history is actually that which is difficult yeah. and painful. Yeah. yeah. Can I, can I? Please, I was just going to say we've been doing this since the third chapter of Genesis, right? Well, that's true. Right? Yeah. You know, there's, you're told not to do something, you do it, you pay a price, you recover, then they, then they flood you. You do it again. Um, <laughs> then, then and so it, 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 intrinsically, as a human drama, it's not going to be straightforward. Right. And yet we aspire to something yeah. better, right? So I, mean, I want to ask you then, I mean, relatedly, your decision to write a biography of John Lewis. Yes. How you got there and how that connects to this question. That's a very fair question. Um, so John Robert Lewis was, I believe, the most saintly person I ever met. Um, if you, who here met John at some point? Yeah. Didn't he want to make you be a better person? just by standing there, it was a genuine kind of charisma in the, in the ultimate sense. It was a gift from the gods, and it was elevating to be around him. Uh, first time I met him was, uh, it was the last election of 1992. It was a Georgia Senate runoff, as ever. Everything was hanging on Georgia. Uh, we've been doing this a while. Um, and one of the the unit of commerce, if you're a political person on an election night, is not to be seen mm. because people want to think you're off doing something important when really you're just eating cheese cubes in a different room. <laughs> uh, trust me, I've been in both those rooms. Uh, and it was uh, last, last election, I guess first week of December in 1992, and I walk into the, I was the, um, Atlanta bureau chief of the Chattanooga Times. Now, the fact that I was the only person in the Atlanta bureau should not detract from my self-assigned <laughs> office as chief, right? <laughs> I ran it out of the La Quinta Inn on I-85. It was room 206. Uh, I thought I was Scotty Reston, baby. I was there, I was like, you know, teletypes and stuff. Uh, but I walked into this hotel and John Lewis and Lillian are just mm. with the people, mm -hmm. right? They're just with, their, with all of us, not even pretending. And it was the beginning of a conversation that lasted until about three weeks before he died. Uh, this month, this coming month in, in 2020. Um, 
you're probably better at this than I am, but as a biographer, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of the folks who are still making our history. Yeah. I'm not very good at keeping notes, contemporary notes. Hmm. But somehow or another, the Holy Ghost made me do that with oh, wow. Congressman Lewis. Wow. So we were, to, we were together on and off for um, 20 years. Well, mm. 30 years, right? Uh, 28 years. Um, in places as, as different as New York and Washington, Sewanee, Tennessee, um, Montgomery, Selma, Birmingham. And every time I was with him, I was struck by the fact that he, we all talk about being the, or, or heeding the better angels of our nature. He was a better angel and was human mm -hmm. and walking around and bore the scars of physical bravery mm -hmm. in the way Bob Dole did and the way John McCain did. You know, you, you could... You know, you could touch the scar. Mm. Uh, and so when he was diagnosed, yeah. um, I, I always knew I'd write about him at some point. I was hoping we'd have another 20 years with him. Um, but when he, you know, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer pretty quickly. I mean, by, by the time they got it, it was. Yeah. Uh, and, and I worried, this is maybe more trade talk than you want, but I wanted to talk to him a couple of more times as I was doing this. And it was really, this book is a theological valentine. Mm. Uh, mm. And I, I worried that it would be an imposition as he was going through the cancer. And interestingly, for him, it ended up being somewhat therapeutic. Oh. He liked it. So there was, there was a day where he did his chemo, and there was a day where he talked to me, and there was a day... You know, he dealt with, you know, dealt with different things. Um, and so I wanted to do it because if there is an answer to our current crisis, it, is, it lies somewhere in our capacity to at least get close to what he did. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a final point on this is yeah. he's a New Testament figure. He's a biblical figure. One of my tricks with, uh, not a trick, it's a very important device, uh, but if I'm writing about living people, I always ask them two questions. One is, what's your first memory? And the other is, what do you dream about? Ooh. And his first memory was, and he, you know, he, he, he could have read the phone book and you would have gotten goosebumps, right? Uh, he said, it was of my mother's garden. Oh. And, of course, we all began in a garden, mm -hmm. right? And then what he dreamt about, and I will confess, perhaps I shouldn't say this, I thought it might be nightmares. Mm -hmm. About 41 it, arrests, sure. you know, concussed, the tear gas. Um, and parenthetically, if you think about it, John Lewis was in more physical danger when we couldn't see him during the movement than when we could. I mean, he went to Parchment after the Freedom Rides, which Faulkner called Destination Doom. Yeah. Um, but we began in a garden. His na the, the, the biblical references piled up. He wasn't known as John in his childhood. He was known as Robert or Bob. Mm -hmm. And he became John when <laughs> so he went. So Alabama. Yeah, yeah. When he went. That's my home. That's why when I got he, Well, when he came that. to Tennessee yeah. as, as, as good <laughs> Sensible people do. Um, uh, all right. Where are you from? Memphis. Well, uh, that barely counts. <laughs> I'm married to a Mississippian, so I can say that. Uh, it's all kind of the same. Um, the only sense in which she married up was marrying a Tennessean, because we have we have hardback books. Uh, but uh, oh, she. Hey, sweetie. How are you? Um, it's going to be a rough, a rough <laughs> evening. Um, he ch so, his, so like, like Elijah, like Abraham, like Peter, he received a different name when he received a different kind of work. Mm -hmm. And he did it on a hill. Yeah, right. He's ready to preach. 
You don't know what you started now. <laughs> right? <laughs> On the holy hill. Yeah. I'm an Episcopalian. We don't actually know how to preach. <laughs> I can make you a drink. <laughs> uh, and so it just piles up. And he was willing to do something. The rest of us talk about it. He did it. Mm. You know, he, he, he was like Silas and Paul, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that's why I did it. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to recover, it's going to be because enough of us are at least inspired by that remarkable example to do the right thing just enough of the time. Mm. And I think that's what history is. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't expect us to be perfect, which is good because I'll be disappointed. But I think we're a 51-49 country. And I think what Imani's that's saying the about... Truth. Yeah. And we, now we literally are. Yes. Uh, and that's the delta right now, right? I mean, 35% of the country was in favor of what Joe McCarthy was doing after the censure. Right? So 35% is always, you know. Um, what's remarkable about right now is that 48% of the country is on that side. That's right. And so it's getting that 14%, and hopefully enough of them live in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. Um, but so you're more of a historian than a biographer. Is that fair? I am. I mean, I've written one biography, but it's, it was as much really social history as yeah. biography. Yeah. I own three copies of it. Um, Thank you. So the... Um, um, yeah. But I, that, what you said really resonated. No. Do, do you think, do people like me make too much of human agency? No. I mean, I think part of the reason I, I love that description of the purpose of the biography when you, you began talking about how he was with the people, and I will say classic Alabama disposition, yeah. um, but that, and, and this sort of, and this a kind of humility, right? A humility that coincided with greatness um, that to me that says something about the decision to write about him was actually an intervention into an argument about the nature of, of leadership that we need in the moment. Right? Absolutely. And I tend to write sort of people's histories or organizational histories, as you know. Um, but I, I, and I have sort of, and that was sort of my academic training, but I am increasingly aware the more that I study organizations of various sorts, that leadership is not an inconsequential matter, even as you know, those of us who've turned to people's history, right? And to understand how people are inspired to organize themselves. So even in the context of, of the movement, where people have, you know, talked about, well, let's not talk about sort of the figure of King as much. Let's talk about SNCC. Let's talk about the organizers. But somebody on the bus would start the song off in Fannie Lou Hamer that would actually give people the courage to go on, right? And that is a form of, of leadership. And the thing, but the but the thing that I I I was I stopped and I was listening to you, but I was also thinking when you talked about Parchman, yeah, is Parchman still exists, and they started to introduce air conditioning last year, apparently, wow. right? Do y'all know Parchman? It's the, it's the state, state penitentiary, penitentiary in Mississippi. In Mississippi, and in still, Sunflower County. Um, still absolutely horrific conditions. And I think the question for me with, about the uses of history is, it is that it is, it is the persistence, right? We have all of these sort of at least nominal aspirations, mm -hmm. um, proclamations, and the persistence of the unbelievable cruelty that is rendered in, in some ways in terms of political divides, but also in our sort of our disposition to turn away from the places of suffering. Yeah. So to, I place yeah. John Lewis in Parchman. Yeah. The, you know, is actually really significant in this moment, right? The people who have been in the places, right? He, yeah, and so we were with him. We were lucky. We were with him uh, on blood, the anniversary of Bloody Sunday in 2020. It was a, honestly, I think it was four days before COVID shut everything down. It was when we were all doing this with our elbows. Yeah. Um, and we thought that was going to be all right. Um, and John Lewis for, oh God, really from the time he went to Congress in 86, uh, 
was a kind of rolling memorial, right? He was a respirating anniversary mm. again and again and again. And I've never been around anyone who could be standing on a bridge where he had altered the course of the American century and bent the arc of a moral universe toward justice, shed blood on that asphalt. And by the way, who's, y'all been on the Pettus Bridge? Yeah. If you haven't, go. Because yeah. A, you have to. it's not like that little thing over there, yeah. right? It is, it's up there. You feel alone. And you're John Lewis and you put a banana, an orange, and a copy of Richard Hofstetter. Mm. I, which I mm. think I would have just stick with the fruit, but um, uh, in your backpack, in a toothbrush, because you expect to be arrested. Mm-hmm. But mm. John Cloud, the Alabama troopers, it was, it's, 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 it's the iconic story, right? It's a scriptural story now, but it happened 20 minutes ago, right? I'm a boringly heterosexual white Southern male Episcopalian, right? These are my people who were on Mm -hmm. the wrong side of this. I was born afterward. I like to think I would have been on the right side, but if everybody who thinks they would have been on the right side had been on the right side, we we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. Right, right. Right? Right. So he was standing there. He said a few years ago, a few children of God got together on this bridge and shed a little blood to try to redeem the soul of America. Mm Mm-hmm. That, he just, he just, and he was back, this was also fascinating, he was back to his college weight because of the cancer. Mm. And so he looked like he had looked on March 7th, 1965. And it, it, was just, it was just a remarkable set of circumstances. And the point of sainthood is not to be so remote that you're intimidating and out of reach. Mm -hmm. The point of sainthood is to be on a pedestal so more people can see you, right? Mm -hmm. And so he was not perfect, but he was a hell of a lot more perfect than most of us. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if we can just close some of that gap, and Imani is exactly right, we did begin this particular constitutional experiment with a declaration. Mm -hmm. It was the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, that all men are created equal. And it was written by a deeply flawed man. I am careful when I say the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, largely because of the old story about the Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in the public schools and said on the campaign trail one day, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. So I'm careful careful about that. But... um, that's so <laughs> George, when George, when George W. Was, was governor, I told him that story. He went, <laughs> he said, so that's pretty funny, asshole. <laughs> so. Um, so let me say, say this, because I have, I, I, I find myself experiencing deeply conflicted emotions every year at Jubilee in Selma. Yeah. Because it's this glorious memorialization and lots of very powerful people come and march, walk over the bridge, and we honor, you know, the the civil rights movement veterans. And then everybody leaves, and Go there's home. desperate poverty in Selma. Yes. And um, and it's getting worse. Yes. And you know, it's not just that you know it's poverty. It's farmers are dispossessed and. And I just am trying to find a way to tell history that allows us to bring the sort of the memorialization and the heroism to our ethical responsibilities in the present moment. The mechanics of memory cannot take precedence over the necessity for action. Yes. Of course. Um, and I will say this, I know someone who agrees with you deeply is the 46th president of the United States. Mm. And if you go read mm. Joe Biden's speech last March, That's, yeah. mm-hmm. it is about Selma today. Mm-hmm. That's right. He explicitly wanted to do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, now you, you memorialized your own journey. I did. Um, what did you learn when mm. you were doing the memoir? Besides the fact that when you hang out with me, you get a National Book Award. <laughs> yes, and writing about hanging out with you is the key to that, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, I learned that my, that my grandmother went to high school in, in Nashville, Pearl High among other things, and visited when I visited That's your right. class, which is wonderful, and found out that half of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton had grandparents who went to Pearl High in Nashville. None of us are from Nashville. And this actually becomes part of the work that I'm doing now because I'm getting off the question. That's right. But um, because I am interested now in sort of recovering histories that actually help us understand how people got to the point of being able to... to have a movement, because I think that's part of the answer to the question. But I mean, one of the things that I think, I mean, I, I had an inclination before, not an inclination, but something I knew that, the th that my experience wasn't singular in the sense that the South is a complicated and beautiful and painful place because of its incredible intimacies that coexists with deep cruelty. Mm -hmm. And that that becomes actually a way to understand the nation, right? So a couple weeks ago, I was in Little Rock interviewing a 90-year-old um, teacher for this uh, this archival project. And so we were walking around at with Central her. High? Cent she, had, she did not teach at Central <laughs> High. Um, she taught at Dunbar, because Central right. is segregated, right? Her daughter went to Central. But we walked around the streets and you, uh, three blocks from her house, Central High was, right? And there are also several HBCUs right next to Central High, which is not unusual for those in the, in the set, right? The, yeah. the color line is, is, um, has always been porous. But I kept thinking about the mobs outside of Central High could be heard from her house. And that, that is, you know, that the, the intimacy is actually really key because we tell this mythology that, well, people just know each other better. Things will be yeah. different, right? And that familiarity and even care and ideology are different matters, right? And that, that people, and I think that this is part of the sort mm -hmm. of the 4951 point, right? The thing that makes it hard is that they don't actually hate in interpersonal ways mm -hmm. everybody that is being subject to the venom, right? Oh, it's it's driving Miss Daisy. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's if you're if you're going to look at that. That's right. That era, absolutely. And we're still, but see that that I think we think that we're not there, but in many ways, sure, we're there still, right? Sure. And so, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, I, what I think history can do mm. is, we only learn from stories. We now actually know this, right? The brain science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We yeah. actually know this. And so, the central. It seems to me, the story we tell. And my f friends of mine to my left sometimes think I do this too much. Um, uh, to a quick story about a very small category called great tweets. Um, it's like French military victories in the 20th century, and it, it's not going to take long. Uh, but uh, about six months ago, someone tweeted that if Doris Kearns Goodwin and Mr. Rogers had had a one-night stand, I would have resulted. I love that. And, That's, and it, That's so good. I thought it was great. Doris was kind of pissed off. <laughs> so she wrote me, and she said, Could, couldn't we? She called, actually. She said, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have fallen in love, and you were the fruit of our... I said, no, sweetheart. He picked you up in the C-SPAN bar. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but... What, what, there, is a, there is a part of the broadly put, the center left, that thinks that a narrative of American progress is exculpatory. And mm. it emphasizes the good and does not take account of the ill. And folks on the right, many of whom happen to be governors and in state legislatures, <laughs> want it to all be great. Right. Right, all good. The point is that history is us, and y'all are better people than I am, but I know that if I do the right thing 51% of the time, that's a heck of a good day. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that many of them. 
So why would a democracy, which is the fullest expression of all of us, be any different? And so to me, that, to me it's remarkable we've gotten this far hmm. in many ways, mm -hmm. which may not be, you know, hugely, you know, fascinating. to feel say. Great. Yeah, yeah. But think about it, because we are really, here you go, assess the validity of this statement, Professor. Okay. Um, we weren't founded in 1619. No. We weren't founded in 1776. We were founded as we know it, the country we live in at this hour, in 1965. Mm. The first multiracial electorate in American history was in 1968, 20 minutes ago. So we're middle-aged. People talk about the 250-year experiment and all that. Not really. Not not the folks we're talking about. John Lewis was born, for, John Lewis saw a white person once until he was 14, and it was the postman, right? So this is a young experiment. Yeah. And it's a more, to me, it's a moral question. It's how we are with each other. To go to my, to go to what my dad said about being your neighbor, uh, uh, if we don't see each other, it took a minute, but thank you. Thank you. I waited. Did you notice that? You saw that? Um, so if we don't see each other as neighbors, it doesn't work. And I don't mean that we have to love each other. If everybody loved each other, Jesus wouldn't have had to command it. Yeah. Right? You don't, you, don't, you don't put up traffic signs if everybody's driving safely. I think you've been in some churches that weren't Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that. But, but do you agree no, with no. the 65 thing? I do on one. Ca I, 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 I have... Um, Maybe 65, but also maybe 1492. And let me say why I say that. Um, because, and, and I think there's a fundamental tension, which goes, it's just echoing a point that you made earlier. Because I tell, one of the stories I tell in the book is about having an ancestor who was born in 1769, a woman named Easter, who was born in Maryland, whose parents were born in Maryland, who watched ostensibly as a child watched the nation become a nation as a child working from tobacco fields, yeah. right? And not being contemplated as a member of the nation. And that, that reality of a place that is founded on, that is predicated on the non-contemplation of people who are in the midst and often doing the labor to make it possible begins at the beginning, right, of the encounter. You know, yeah. the European encounter, yeah. and that that thread persists, not necessarily in that form, but the the our willingness to discount people who are in our midst who do the labor, who to, to mark them as those who don't count. So I agree with you as a matter, absolutely, um, the nation as such, in terms of who is is is. is um, our citizens. Who's we the people? Who's we the people? And yet we have, we still have that problem. Yeah. We still have a habit of of um, creating people who are essentially non-persons before the law. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so for me, the point is that the question of founding is actually something that should be an open question, right? I'm much more interested in stories about the nation as a history of debate. This is, so for the same reason that I don't like originalists in terms of um, you know, juris, jurisprudence, I also am not interested in telling a new story of the nation. Neither one particularly appealed to me. I want to tell the story of the conflict, that right. the debate over who we are has been present from the beginning, and that that debate has been has often been bloody and difficult, and that who we are is actually constituted in that in that tension, yep. right? Totally agree. Yeah, I and the only th a thought I would offer there yeah. is, is that one way to one of the reasons I argue these things from history mm. uh, is that. Folks on the right say they love the past, 
So let's figure out what the past really was. Folks on the left love data. That's so Histories are right. Our social. Side. So this is kind of the this this is the best gateway drug I've come up with mm -hmm. uh, to widen the aperture and get people to have this conversation about who we are now is by how did we get to who we are, whatever the answer to that question is. And what I say to my conservative friends, and again, I live in Tennessee, so when I say I have conservative friends, that's redundant, um, is we have always grown stronger the more widely we've opened our arms. Hmm. The more diverse we have become, the more powerful we have become. A, it's just a clinical matter. The largest Air Force in the world is the United States Air Force. Do you all know what the second one is? Thank you. The United States Navy's is the second. We're fine. We're fine in terms of power. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of folks who look like me who think that's not true and who feel that there's a personal loss of identity, of prosperity, of opportunity. And to dismiss that is to foreclose the possibility of reaching those folks. And so that we can't do that. It's irresponsible and counterproductive to the project, I would argue, the project is that every generation that has made the Declaration of Independence more real mm -hmm. is the generation you'd want to be part of. I mm -hmm, believe. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think, though, I mean, I wonder, and I, I sometimes feel that I sound Pollyannish about this. But do you think that part of that is that we have, we don't have a conversation about the common good? We don't have a conversation about civic response? I just, yeah, I, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I know you think differently, so this is probably why I'm asking yeah. this as a provocation. But I, but I do wonder how much people in the United States think of a we at all anymore as opposed to in terms of a zero-sum game of self-interest? I don't think that's new in the least. Okay. I, 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 you, you think it's always been that way? Yeah, because I, I, I'm sorry, this is my Gen Genesis chapter three point. Okay. We're fallen, frail, and fallible. Uh, the Constitution is fundamentally a theological document because it assumes that everything we want to do will be wrong. That's why it's so hard to get anything done. Right. The census, and to interpret it. The sense of sin, mm -hmm. which was so real. Remember, the, mo what, the most important person we never talk about, there are many of those, but one of the most important people in the story, of the, in the white guy story of the founding, is a guy named John Witherspoon, who was the president of Princeton when it was the College of New Jersey. He taught something like 48 signers of the Declaration and the Constitution. I've, I've done this so you don't have to. I've read his lectures. You can thank me later. <laughs> Uh, for having taken that burden off of you. It's all John Calvin. Mm -hmm. It's we are depraved. We're right. terrible. So let's minimize our depravity, the effects of our depravity. Right? And so my favorite example, my favorite example. Okay. Of, all right. This is my, la my last little <laughs> story. My favorite example of this is if you see if you agree with the premise here, okay. If there were a moment where we had a conversation about the common good, wouldn't it be the Depression and World War II? Wouldn't that be a, a reasonable one? Yes. Okay. Do y'all remember when we declared war on Germany? It was after Germany declared war on us five days after Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. We didn't declare war on Nazi Germany. Right. Okay. Hitler, it was one of the three mistakes Hitler made. So we were literally dragged into, into our World finest War. hour. Right. Five days after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Because FDR didn't know if he was going to have a two, he couldn't know if he could fight a two front war because Congress was still isolationist in the Atlantic. Pacific, okay, they took care of that. The longest five days of Winston Churchill's life was between December 7th and December 12th, 1941, because he thought he might be facing Hitler truly alone. Mm. Tom Hanks once said, he was once asked, why do you keep making movies about World War II? And he said, because it was good versus evil and Grandpa won. <laughs> but Grandpa didn't fight until he absolutely had to. So, yes. I you agree, stop there, except that yes. point. Yes. <laughs> I'm not, though. 
Yes, because professor. I, yes, professor. Yeah. Um, so, but here's the thing. I, 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 I take that point. I do think there's a distinction, though, between the recognition um, that we are depraved and the belief that we ought aspire to be something other than depraved and the belief that it is actually, the virtue is, is selfishness. And I do think that that has, and, I, and I'm not, I'm really not making a point about, um, I, I don't want to make a declension narrative. I actually instead want to think about storytelling yeah. in a way, right? And how we tell the story of what it means to be a good person as actually the necessary but insufficient element to that kind of transformation. Yes. Right. Yes. And I, I, so for me, Amen. you know, when you made the point about, you know, um, uh, you know what conservatives like the past and, and left and, and left is like data, right? Data is, is, you know, it's not quite storytelling, right? Yeah. And, and, and that there is actually something important about, I think, about tell, as actually for people as they come of age, to tell a story about what it means to be a good person in the world, not because, um, you know, that's going to make everybody be a good person, but we do have something. I don't know, there's a conversation. I, I, I didn't. I don't. F I didn't experience that coming of age. I didn't. I don't think that there was a kind of. It's compared to my thing that my parents' generation. There was a very clear message that you had to. That you were supposed to be a good person. Now they have right. vastly different ideas about what that constituted. Right. 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 What it meant to be a good person. But so that's just my. That's my little um, Pollyannish moment. We don't. Well, have but, to but let, let's, if, if, you, if you don't mind being autobiographical for a second. Yes. So that you were raised after the movement. Yes. After Watergate, after Vietnam. So really, you got this narrative in the age of Reagan and Bush. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and and, and coming up in a movement family, yeah. right? I was I was personally told, you know, you're supposed to serve the people, but I felt like the public message was you're supposed to, you know, you have all this opportunity, you're supposed to go on Wall Street and make a lot of money and and yeah. be a shark, right? Yeah, that's what the door is open for. Yeah, right. I think, I think you've done fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I've tried. I I I think that. We were talking before about civics. My my only and yeah, obviously I'm for civics. I mean, yeah, you know, like uh, my worry is that it becomes about means, not ends, mm -hmm. which is important, and that it becomes and a word I hate, but we might as well use it. It becomes weaponized again. Yeah, um, sure. This this I think it's I think it's history. I think this falls to and anyone can tell this story, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's why when I teach, I teach almost entirely by case study. Uh, why did we declare independence in June, in July of 1776 instead of April 1775, right? When blood's on the ground in Lexington and Concord, right? What happened? Uh, two votes in the constitutional ratification and we don't have this drama at all mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. um you know just sort of but always doing it it's the one thing i think business schools have done for us is they gave us case studies um and so that's the i think that's the work we have to do and anybody can do it yeah we need citizen historians i think oh absolutely i absolutely agree yeah. with that yeah. i think we're supposed to What's on y'all's mind, Question. as we say? Yes. You want to call? You want me to? You should do it, because I don't have my glasses on. Can't see anything. Hi, uh, this is uh, <laughs> apropos of nothing and off topic, but for those of us who follow John Meacham, why don't we ever know how funny you were? Oh. I mean, I'm a former sitcom writer. You missed your calling. I believe there's so And I want you to write a funny book next. You can make it laugh throughout history, but come on. OK. OK, it's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, people in assisted living facilities were my basic. <laughs> when the tapioca served, I come out, I do some stuff, it's great. 
Right behind you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think she was first. Okay. Oh. Or we could just stop on that. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your words and everything. I'm Jenny from Georgia and I Where? Have Atlanta and prior to that Swanee. Uh, so I Swanee, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Oh. Not not honestly. that. Yeah, just but <laughs> stop, we can't be talking like that. They told me just ask me a question. Okay. But to tell you that John Lewis is an incredible human and I had the pleasure to be in a viral video with him yeah. dancing to Happy okay. by Pharrell. You were in the happy That's video. Me. Oh wow. That's I'm so the, great. I'm the one in the yeah. pink dress. Um, so y'all could Google it, but my, <laughs> my, my first part is our people, Southerners, black and brown folks, we are folks who look to joy in times of hardship. Yes. What is happening on the other side? What, what, why is there not joy there? And what stops, what stops the white community? from wanting others to experience happiness and joy in the South as we're trying to move forward to something better? Mm -hmm. Why do we have to keep stopping? Like we're seeing in Georgia and Florida and Tennessee, there's always these laws that are stopping mainly our communities. What's going on? And why do we have Marjorie Taylor Greene, period? <laughs> <laughs> End of sentence. <laughs> Um. Not since the first man raised his fist to the sky and said, why, God, why, has there been a more existential question <laughs> than that? Uh, well, speaking for the white community. Um, yes, need to take some notes. Kind of my only, kind of my only, <laughs> my only community. Um, we were talking before about our various fashion. My fashion icon is Fred McMurray in My Three Sons, which you're way too young to know what that means. Um, so I would, I would, the premise I would admin slightly is it's not monolithic. Okay. So that's point one. Point two is it is sin and sadness and fear. And Aristotle defined fear as the feeling produced by the anxiety at the prospect of the loss of something you love. Right. It's a great definition. And American politics, human nature is shaped, to go to Imani's point, about the conflict, not necessarily between red and blue and urban and rural, but between hope and fear. And I know the president's trying to give hope a chance and pushing that. And it's always a close run thing. What about shame? Can I? I'm, I'm all for shame. <laughs> you know, the thing, that, really? the thing that's, that's fascinating about the question around joy is that, um, and I think it makes me think about the history of slavery, right? And the simultaneous regulation of expressions of joy and the partaking in the joy Right? is that it really wasn't about whether joy could exist, but what kind people were allowed to have and when it was perceived as a threat and whether who could partake in it. Right? And I think that goes to the point about fear and the fear that certain kinds of expressions of joy might actually undermine a system of domination or control or exclusion. Um, and so, you know, I was tell who was I was talking to somebody the other day about oh my son about line dancing and he was like oh this is the thing, you know that because he doesn't like line dances and he was like you know it's the one thing I don't like about black folks are always line dancing I said white people do it too in the south right that there are expressions of you know and the point being there there are expressions of jubilation that are actually we 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 share very deeply, and so that it, it become I think it's sort of just it's actually a symbol of control as opposed to the fact of joy, right? I don't know. Hugely important point mm. about, again, in, in the stories we tell, one thing to remember, I think one thing important to remember, and I sort of owe Eric Foner for this, I think. Yeah. Um, the extension of liberty and opportunity to others is not a surrender of liberty and opportunity for you. Yeah. 
but it, yeah, it's not a zero sum game. Right. Right. Now. Thank you. Hi, Dawn from New Orleans, and I've ah. been to the hill. So uh, there you go. Your hill, um, Imani. You said something that just has been dogging me for days. I've been saying it's like they should have named this the Civility Conference. And I've been here many times, and I love the people and everything. Uh -huh. But it's like, and when you said familiarity and care and ideology are not the same, right? And so we've had a lot of sessions about need to be more civil, we need to be more, which often ends up to me sounding a lot like compromise by all the people who've been compromising the whole way along. So I'm curious, and John, you've been to this conference many, many times, how would you strengthen the conversations we're having here to action? Oh, that's such a great question. I'm going to let I'm going to say a little bit, but I have not been here before, so I don't actually know it that well. Then you probably have separate ideas. <laughs> That's true, even if she had been. I say. Um, I mean, I this and I again this at the at the risk of um, I. I am not against civility, right? And so sometimes I, I, like, and this is, so people have gotten on me because I'm actually, I will say things like, we, we, it's important that we be able to talk to each other. And people say, oh, you're just an advocate for this. And it, but my father taught me, he said, if you actually have the conviction of your beliefs, then you're not afraid to talk to anybody, right? Because at the, after the conversation, the possibility is that they might be moved Right, and but even if they're not, you still have the courage of your convictions, right? And he and he, so he said, don't be afraid to talk to anybody about any topic. There are times when it, of course, is exhausting, right? Um, and I do think that there, I, I'm jumping around a little bit, but the other day I was talking to someone in where I don't even remember where I was. Oh, Cincinnati, and she was a white woman who said, I don't even know any of those types of like Trump people. And I was sort of like, that's not actually particularly useful. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, she was making the point I'm ver about her virtue that she doesn't hang out with those type of folks. Somebody has to talk to them. Usually they don't want to listen to me, although my next door neighbor does. And he's ultra conservative and has basically an arsenal in his, in his house. And he's actually the most civil person to me on my block. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> I'm not moving, because you know what? Ain't no place to go. If, as long as I stay in this country, where am I going? I mean, I might not know. The reason I know is because I know him, yeah. right? Yeah. But I very well could not know, right, what his beliefs actually are. Um, and so I do think that there is, uh, there is a value in having difficult conversations, including asking, well, then what does this mean? What are we prepared to do after we leave here? What transformation, where are you going to place your resources? Where, who can you invest in? Can you make sure this is a long-term investment? Will you join an organization? Can you sustain membership in that organization for a set number of years? How can we, can we talk about how we sustain this? Can we track each other, right, over time? I do think that those, the con, the, making the conversation turn to action is actually saying that there's some expectations that the conversation turns to action and then holding ourselves accountable. And I put myself in that number. Right. Um, yeah. It's really hard. Um, I mean, there, there's really nothing harder, and it's gotten worse. Um, this has uh, this has gotten worse. The capacity to uh, talk to people with whom you disagree, and I don't want to pretend it's easy. I'm sort of. Um, I got, I didn't get canceled, I got postponed, hashtag postponed. It, it's, it's not quite as dramatic. Uh, by a college in Alabama, um, a year or two ago, three, three years ago, maybe. And um, it was for a, it, I'd spoken at a Planned Parenthood event in South Texas, and I was invited to speak to a, uh, I guess a Southern Baptist school in near Birmingham. And there was a protest. Mm. I was supposed to speak on civility and dialogue. 
So irony was not a strong suit down there. Um, but I went eventually, and I appreciated just that it was a postponement. And I felt I had to go, partly because I wanted to say that civility's fine, but if it's just about being polite, I'm not interested. Right. Right? Civility is about mutual respect. It's not about, as we grew up with, sir and mamming. Mm-hmm. And Surface, if yeah. you don't recognize, I, again, sorry to play the Mr. Rogers thing again, but I left my cardigan in the <laughs> car. Uh, if we don't see each other as neighbors, then it, it's not going to work. It's just, the, 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 we had a good run, <laughs> democracy, American democracy. But if it were easy, everybody would do it. And we're pretty much the oldest functioning one, pretty much. Um, it is a moral question. Mm. It's, and I don't mean moral in, in Sunday school. No, no, sense. in a moralizing sense, but yeah. It, it's, it's, it's how we are with each other. But do you, I mean, I think this for me is actually why I think I find, I'm so incensed, and I know we're out of time, by the hijacking of the concept of freedom of expression yeah. by, the, by the right when it actually is the, those are the forces that are actually limiting our capacity so often to talk to each other and to know and to study history, right? Yeah. That I think that the reclamation yeah. of that in the service yep. of a de democratic sensibilities is actually really important. And the narrative is, is, is absolutely critical. And uh, very quickly, I, I had a student at Vanderbilt who was, um, uh, she was, would have fit right in in the Comin turn of the 1930s. Uh, you know, she was like, Bernie Sanders was too soft, you know, the whole thing. And we got into a debate one day about whether the Declaration of Independence was an Enlightenment era document. Oh. Interesting question, right? And which was sort of what it was, it was partly it was semantic because it was, it was, what she meant was it was not enlightened in the way we would want it to be. Oh. Absolutely fair. Absolutely okay. fair. But I assigned this class, I said, okay, we're going to talk about, to bring this somewhat full circle, aspiration and reality. I want everybody to go read Frederick Douglass's 1876 speech at the Freedmen's Monument in Washington. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read that, you should use the Google machine. Uh, Pull it right up. The, the Googles, as W called it. Um, <laughs> and it's the best meditation on biography and I would say democracy I've ever read. Mm -hmm. It's about... Yeah, Lincoln was slow. He was cold, tardy, and indifferent. Wonderful Douglas phrase. But in the end, as a statesman, he was bound to consult the opinion of the country that had elected him. And we came to know that our hour of uh, redemption was born was tied up with this man in this moment. And not perfect, but better than the alternative. And as President Biden says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And that's a pretty profound insight, I think. One more? Do we want to go? I feel guilty over here. Y'all want to go to the bar, I understand. <laughs> Imani Perry, thank you. Thank you.